Today we're going to be um, presenting a webinar uh, called The True Cost of BPA and Other Toxins, Dollars in Disease. And our presenter, uh, Dr. Trasande, is going to be um, talking a little bit about the connection between toxic chemicals, rising rates of disease, and healthcare costs. And, and after he talks, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the current opportunities to kind of get involved in um, the uh, advocacy around reducing exposures to um, in our community. Um, and I, you know, as probably most of you know, Physicians for Social Responsibility is an organization which represents thousands of health professionals across the U.S. And these health professionals care deep, deeply about the health of their communities. And we believe that prevention is the answer to rising disease rates and health care costs. Um, and so um, let me just give a little intro to uh, Dr. Trasande. Um, he's an associate professor in pediatrics, environmental medicine, and health policy at New York University. And his research focuses primarily on looking at the role of environmental and other factors in chronic childhood diseases. And um, he also documents the economic costs for policymakers of failing to prevent them proactively. Um, and he currently serves on a United Nations Environment Program Steering Committee, which is developing a global outlook on chemicals policy. And he also sits on the Executive Committee of the Council for Environmental Health of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, so he, he knows a lot about this topic. And I also believe he, um, he also did, used to work in, um, did a fellowship in uh, former Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton's office, and so he also knows the policy side, which is which is great to kind of have both both viewpoints. So before I turn it over to Dr. Trisande, just run real quickly over the agenda. So Dr. Trisande is going to give his presentation, and then we'll have a, a question and answer, um, and then, like I said, I'm going to talk a little briefly about some of the ways health professionals can get involved right now in the um, advocacy around reducing toxic chemicals in our environment. So, so Dr. Jusande, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll focus my talk uh, principally on the impact of chemicals on kids and the economic consequences of those impacts. Um, and a theme throughout these talks, I hope, will be uh, focusing on the economic benefits as well of prevention. Um, so just to provide some brief background with respect to kids and environmental hazards, um, they're vulnerable for multiple reasons. They have greater exposures to a given chemical than us as adults. They're less well able to eliminate or prevent the health effects of chemical exposures as they experience them. Um, they're developing organis uh, organ systems uh, for which they're not only more susceptible, but for which the effects of toxic exposure can be permanent and lifelong. Um, and they have greater years of life in which to manifest disease. Um, so over the past roughly four decades, we've seen epidemic increases in chronic disease in, in the US and other industrialized nations. Uh, that's been contemporaneous with the widespread increase uh, in the use of chemicals. Uh, depending on which number you take, uh, there are either 80,000 or 143,000 chemicals in widespread use. The 80,000 estimate is a somewhat dated estimate from the Environmental Protection Agency with one to 3,000 new chemicals introduced into commerce each year, whereas the 143,000 chemical estimate comes from the European Union is a much more recent estimate uh, in the context of some very positive regulatory effort. Uh, that they have uh, taken on over in Europe. Um, but it's not only the contemporaneous association of chemical exposures with chronic disease. Uh, there have been population-based studies that have documented strong and consistent associations with these exposures. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences, our, our nation's most esteemed scientific body, has documented that 28 percent of developmental disabilities are at least in part due to environmental factors, with the majority of that being the concert of genetics together with environment, with a genetic susceptibility coupled along with an environmental exposure. Um, 
studying childhood cancer and its environmental risk factors are difficult is difficult largely because of the fact that cancer is so fortunately rare in children, but we at least know that benzene, 1,3-butadiene, and certain other air pollutants have been associated with the development of childhood cancer. Um, and outdoor air pollutants have long been known to exacerbate childhood asthma, but also may increase the risk of the development of, of asthma. So why have we been so slow to do anything with respect to protecting children from environmental hazards? Well, uh, in part, this has to do with the regulatory framework, which is antiquated. The Toxic Substances Control Act of 1976 doesn't require pre-market testing. It also has a very weak 90-day period in which chemicals uh, are screened by the Environmental Protection Agency, where the Environmental Protection Agency doesn't have the remit to require strong pre-market testing. And as a result, fewer than half of the most highly produced chemicals have any toxicity testing data, and fewer than a fifth have data with respect to developing organs and their effect on children. Um, absent a pre-market testing paradigm, the epidemiologic studies that then have to proceed take many years. The outcomes have potential confounders. Their criteria of reproducibility and consistency that are typically required before regulatory action can, can occur. And in addition, there's emerging evidence of non-monotonic and non-linear dose response curves that have further confounded interpretation. Most uh, regulatory toxicology has taken the paracelsium precept that the dose makes the poison when indeed there's a substantial biological basis and biological evidence to support the opposite notion that in fact uh, very low levels of exposure can have uh, greater than linear effects and that lower levels of exposure can be especially uh, toxic. Um, it, clearly there are some strong economic interests at play. The effects that we're talking about are subtle um, and they have many other origins that are plausible. Um, a child's cognitive potential has substantially to do with parental caregiving genetics among other factors, uh, yet we know that environmental factors contribute substantially to the effect uh, to the brain development of a child in an adverse way. Um, and there are difficulties in the, the cost-benefit analyses that one would normally perform are typically performed with few perspectives about the economies of scale and the economic incentive to innovate in a more cost-effective way on behalf of environmental prevention. So the costs that are typically presented for prevention by industry are typically higher than they may actually be in practice. Um, and there's a normative economic pro problem in that industry benefits from not intervening uh, on behalf of the environment, whereas the uh, ch children often suffer the consequences of that effect and don't participate in the economic transaction and reward from that industrial activity. Um, so the rest of this talk goes through a number of case studies um, that document both the economic costs of failure to prevent and the economic benefits of preventing. Uh, and the first may be familiar to many, the story of lead and gasoline. Um, many uh, may know that we knew about the health effects of lead going back to the 1890s, even before. Um, in the 1970s, catalytic converters were not uh, able to handle leaded gasoline. Uh, that likely accelerated, if not was the main basis for the decision to phase out lead and gasoline. A few years later, a fix was identified and the question was raised about the notion of putting lead back in gasoline because it's a cheap uh, agent. Uh, and only when um, serial surveys from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that documented lower, much lower lead levels than um, were anticipated in relationship to drop-offs in lead per, as a percent concentration in gasoline was that effort stopped. And, and to this day, lead remains out of gasoline and actually has been phased out of nearly all countries but six of the most despotic regimes in the world. 
Uh, Scott Gross and others at the Centers for Disease Control documented the economic benefits of that intervention. They compared cognitive potential of children born in the 2000s compared with children born in the 1970s and found that uh, children born in the 1970s uh, were roughly five to seven points smarter with respect to their IQ score. And we now know that children who have higher IQs are more able to contribute to the economy. And there's a, a strong linear relationship between uh, IQ score and lifetime economic productivity such that you can calculate the economic benefit of improved IQ. And over the entire U.S. population, the cohort of children born in 2000 uh, are roughly to this day 200 billion uh, over their lifetimes more economically productive than the children born in the 1970s. And that economic benefit of removing lead of gasoline continues as each new cohort of children is not exposed uh, to lead of gasoline and has lowered lead levels as a result. There's uncertainty around that estimate, so that's why in the three columns you see ranges from 110 billion to 318 billion, but the economic benefits are still, even under the most conservative scenarios, quite substantial. Uh, these estimates have been taken uh, globally uh, in the context of the global effort that I mentioned earlier of removing lead and gasoline, and the economic benefits of getting lead out of gasoline in the global uh, environment are now estimated on the order of 4% of global GDP, $2.45 trillion, not just benefits from economic productivity, but reduced criminality, other uh, reductions in human health and disease. Um, the second case study is the effort, uh, perhaps not fully executed until recently, to remove mercury from coal-fired power plants. Uh, back uh, in the early era uh, years of the Bush administration, there were efforts to roll back um, amendments in the 1990 Clean Air Act uh, that required maximum achievable control technology, and the and specifically the filtration of coal-fired power plants for mercury. Um, the technical analyses that were proposed as part of a, a legal uh, document that was uh, proposed in Congress in support of these regulations uh, suggested that there were no health effects of mercury exposure, let alone to uh, children in utero. Um, and this go, flies in the face of substantial evidence, including from the National Academy of Sciences, documenting strong evidence for fetal neurotoxicity of methylmercury. Um, and so in that context, we did a series of analyses documenting the effects of prenatal mercury exposure to the cohort of children born in 2000. And what we found was that the 10% most highly exposed children in the U.S. population uh, suffered decrements in IQ ranging from three quarters of an IQ point to three IQ points with economic costs on the order of $8.7 billion. We then disaggregated those costs by their source of attribution, first looking at American emissions of mercury and then within those American emissions, coal-fired power plant emissions, and we found that the cost of mercury emissions attributable to American power plants was on the order of $1.3 billion. In addition, um, we did a series of analyses documenting not just the lost economic productivity, but the increases in, men in mental retardation, or better called intellectual disability to this day, associated with shifts of IQ in a population and increases in the number of children with subnormal IQ, i.e. Uh, two standard deviations below normal or an IQ lower than 70. And what we found was that there were additional 1,500 cases of mental retardation identified from that same level of exposure in the, in the 2000 U.S. birth cohort with an additional $2 billion in educational, medical, and other social costs. Those are over and above the $8.7 billion costs we documented in, in the previous publication. Um, these data were influential. It's interesting to note historically that then uh, Senator Barack Obama was a member of the Environment and Public Works Committee and was 
the tie-breaking vote, as you may know, there are a number of coal-fired power plants in Illinois. Um, he eventually decided to vote against uh, the Clear Skies Act. Um, after that failed as a legislative vehicle, um, the Bush administration proceeded through a regulatory rulemaking decision through the executive branch to essentially implement the same uh, legislation as an executive action. Uh, states proceeded to sue and or uh, enact more aggressive regulations at the state level. And eventually the Clean Air Mercury Rule, which is the regulatory version of the Clear Skies Act, was essentially overturned uh, through a multi-state uh, lawsuit by a district court in the District of Columbia. Um, what happened thereafter uh, was that eventually President Obama proceeded uh, to implement a more aggressive series of regulations that um, has been the focus of some recent legal challenges but appears to be uh, staying at the present time, uh, which are more in line with what was originally proposed in the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments. Uh, this issue of mercury pollution has also extended to the global atmosphere, recognizing that there's substantial need for energy in developing nations uh, that are trying to accelerate rapidly in economic growth. And the economic costs of global mercury pollution have been estimated on the order of $29 billion, with potentially $2 billion in economic benefits from efforts to limit mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants. And that's been informative to the mercury treaty that um, the United Nations has uh, put into force uh, over the past uh, couple of years. Um, but this issue merits ongoing attention in the context of uh, the rapid increase in coal-fired power plants in, in many of the most rapidly industrializing countries. Um, the third case study is um, relates also back to, to the U.S. Uh, during the Bush administration. There were also multiple failures to limit other uh, chemical hazards in childhood, especially lead-based paint hazards. There was an effort uh, through the Surgeon General's Office to eradicate childhood lead poisoning by 2010. Um, the main vehicle for doing that would have been through proper funding of lead hazard control grant programs to eradicate lead-based paint hazards. This funding was not sufficient, and there were multiple efforts as well looking at outdoor air pollution to and multiple scientifically sound arguments for reducing further uh, regulatory thresholds for um, air pollution in the form of national ambient air quality standards, but these were not uh, carried forth despite uh, substantial scientific argument in favor of reducing air pollution exposure further in the United States. Um, it's in that context that it's important to know that there was a, a 2002 paper that documented $54.9 billion in costs of environmentally mediated diseases in children. Those are for asthma, lead poisoning, childhood cancer, and developmental disabilities. And those are the costs uh, that are directly attributable to the environment within the aggregate costs for those conditions. Um, and we felt in the context of that regulatory failure of in the Bush administration to, that it was time to re-examine the economic costs of environmentally mediated diseases in children. This slide presents those economic costs. This is for an expanded list of conditions, recognizing that emerging evidence suggested that uh, methylmercury toxicity was also uh, substantial in its morbidity. Um, and there was also increasing evidence to suggest environmentally attributable links to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And in aggregate, the portion of those diseases that can be traced back to the environment cost our nation $76.6 billion in 2008, with a relatively generous sensitivity analysis suggesting that they could be as low as 59.8 to $105.8 billion. But even at the most conservative, this represents 2% of U.S. healthcare costs and may represent as much as 3.5% of U.S. healthcare costs. It bears some comparison to examine the costs as they were analyzed uh, in uh, the 2002 publication for the year 1997 compared with the 2011 publication 
uh, looking at costs in 2008, um, bringing the previous estimate up to the same year in dollars, um, there's, as you can see, roughly a 10% drop off from $58.2 billion to $50.9 billion in the cost of childhood lead poisoning. And that represents progress in reducing substantially childhood lead exposures, even though childhood lead poisoning has not been eradicated. Uh, the $50.9 billion estimate actually is substantially higher uh, than it would have been if we had followed simply the approach used in 1997 uh, because we actually applied a higher cost per unit lead exposure. As you can see, methylmercury toxicity and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder were not included in the previous analysis. And you'll note in the third row that childhood asthma costs also dropped substantially, roughly in the order of 30 percent. Um, while changes in medical care may have contributed somewhat to that decrease, they cannot have contributed entirely to that drop-off. And that speaks to the substantial improvements in air pollution that date uh, previous to the Bush administration era uh, that document substantial decreases in particulate matter and ozone, among other pollutants. And as a result, we've seen substantial decreases in asthma morbidity in the United States in the interceding period. And that also speaks again to the long-term long latent benefits of proactive environmental action on behalf of children. The final case study that I wanted to mention briefly is uh, very recent. Um, it, it's regarding the ongoing debate about regulating bisphenol A in food uses. Uh, just to talk briefly, many of you have probably heard substantial amounts about bisphenol A. It's now mainly used in the lining of aluminum cans. It is also used in polycarbonate plastics, but those uses have largely been – am I still there? Kathy, am I still there? You're still on. Okay, I, I just received a note that I had fallen off. That's why I was um, checking in. Okay, I'll just proceed. I apologize. So just to, to uh, resume, um, Bisphenol A has largely been phased out of polycarbonate plastics, such as Nalgene bo bottles and, and such, um, and was banned recently from baby bottles and sippy cups by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Um, in adults, there are substantial exposures that do occur that are not food-related. Uh, you've probably heard recently about a publication suggesting that handlers of thermal paper receipts uh, can have substantial exposure to bisphenol A, largely in adults. Uh, in children, the primary exposure route of BPA is through food, and specifically through the li food uh, lined with aluminum cans, uh, where BPA is used to prevent corrosion. Indeed, dietary interventions have documented substantial decreases in BPA in the context of uh, interventions that uh, improve fresh fruit consumption. Uh, and a a study of intentional exposure to aluminum canned food documents, documents a very substantial increase in BPA levels, suggesting a potentially equally large reduction in, in BPA levels in urine if they're removed from aluminum cans. Um, in laboratory studies, mul uh, BPA is well known to produce all of the molecular hallmarks of childhood obesity. It makes fat cells bigger. It reduces the function of adiponectin, which is extremely effective at protecting against cardiovascular disease. And it may have sex-specific uh, effects on body mass. Um, studies have associated BPA with adult and childhood obesity adult diabetes, cardiovascular diagnoses, and abnormalities in liver function, as well as decrements in uh, cognitive potential in children, as well as coronary artery disease in later life. Um, so what we did, and yet I'll stop, I'll just pause there to say that 
the uh, Food and Drug Administration has recently declined to extend the ban on BPA from in, from food uses to other uh, to aluminum cans and such, largely because it wanted to await evidence about the safety and potential effects of the chemical in in the human experience and specifically um, the Food and Drug Administration on multiple websites has documented that it is indeed safe. Um, we felt in the context of this evidence that it was important to document the economic costs associated with the ongoing BPA exposure and document the economic benefits of prevention. We looked at two outcomes for which the evidence is strongest with respect to causation of disease by BPA. One is childhood obesity and the other is adult cardiovascular disease. With respect to the first, uh, we examined effects across the U.S. population of children with respect to obesity across four groups, uh, roughly from lowest to highest quartiles of exposure. We assessed their uh, median urinary BPA level. We used the dose-response relationship with respect to associations that have been documented of BPA with obesity and documented increments in body mass index uh, standardized z-scores for age and gender, and using um, the notion that uh, BPA is theoretically distributed as a bell curve, we documented shifts in that body mass index z-score to quantify the increment in childhood obesity that could be associated with BPA exposure in the U.S. population. And as you can see there in the third set of numbers, third row of numbers, the increment in obese 12-year-olds is modest on the order of 12,000 children, or roughly 1.7% of childhood obesity that we could trace back to BPA exposure. The economic costs of child health, uh, child health care needs associated with BPA is somewhat low. It's about $27 million. But given that children who are obese are more likely to be obese adults, the increment in longer-term health care expenditures in adulthood that could ultimately be traced back to BPA attributable childhood obesity is substantial. If you also add the decrements in quality adjusted life years that are associated with adult obesity, the aggregate costs of BPA attributable childhood obesity are on the order of $1.5 billion. Looking at the adult cardiovascular costs, we found small increments in coronary heart disease that can be traced back to BPA exposure with nearly an equivalent amount of economic costs, roughly on the order of $1.5 billion over and above the BPA attributable costs of childhood obesity. So in aggregate, there are $3 billion of annual costs associated with childhood obesity, simply examining only two of the many outcomes that are associated with BPA exposure. We then proceeded to examine the benefits and costs of replacing BPA, um, running a counterfactual scenario in which we hypothetically reduced BPA levels by about 66%, there are roughly $1.74 billion of economic benefits associated with prevented childhood obesity and adult coronary heart disease. Compare that with the $2.2 billion cost that would be estimated uh, based upon the cost of one naturally derived alternative, which presumptively does not have health effects associated with it. Um, if there are 2.2 cent costs per can and there are 100 billion cans used in the United States, the economic cost of replacing BPA is $2.2 billion, so slightly higher than the $1.74 billion economic benefit of replacing BPA. But if you look on the second column and specifically on the $13.8 billion extreme of the sensitivity analysis, it could indeed be that the economic benefits of replacing BPA are in the order of six-fold higher than the economic costs of replacing BPA. Now, it should be said that there are replacements of BPA being used even currently, and those replacements themselves may have the same effects as BPA. One in particular of concern is bisphenol S, which actually has the same profile of estrogen disruption as well as greater biological permanence and environmental permanence, suggesting that the effects of BPS may be at least the same, if not higher, uh, compared with BPA. And as you can see, uh, harkening back to your chemistry days, the structures are uh, uncannily similar. So 
But just to say, for just to close up on that thought, the economic benefits of replacing BPA with BPS are probably close to zero insofar as the health effects of BPS are likely to be similar to those of BPA. So just to wrap up, what do we learn from these case studies? Um, they can be influential and document the consequences of policy failures. Uh, this, the data I described about childhood lead exposure also strongly support the need to eradicate uh, lead from paint globally. Recently we've done an estimate of the economic costs of current childhood lead exposure in low and middle income countries and have documented that it approaches one trillion dollars or annually or one percent of global GDP. Um, economic estimates of mercury pollution as we talked about have been influential on mercury treaty negotiations but um, these data need to continue to inform ongoing implementation especially with respect to country specific regulations on emissions from coal-fired power plants. Um, I'd also comment that this is increasingly a global problem and the majority of my talk is focused on the U.S. economic costs associated with environmental exposures in children. Um, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, has documented that industrializing nations are expected to lead in the production and use of high production volume chemicals. Uh, by 2030, or 2020 rather, and this occurs in the context of weak infrastructure to protect environmental and public health. Um, you can imagine that some countries may even have one staff person as their Ministry of Environment. Um, and this speaks to the need for sound chemicals management going forward in the developing world. Uh, and that's been a prominent part of the discussions in the United Nations Environment Program Global Outlook on Chemicals, which I've been happy to be a part of. Our opinion is that sound chemicals management doesn't need to interfere with economic development either. There are actually economic rewards and societal rewards to intervening on behalf of children specifically. and the population at large. There are unfortunately early warning signs of a similar epidemic of chronic childhood disease in association with increasing chemical use. There have been increases in acute lymphocytic leukemia documented in Mexico as well as increases in childhood asthma and these are somewhat dated WHO data but roughly six percent of life years lost uh, in low and middle income countries are attributable to lead exposure and air pollution, substantial amount. Um, the costs of these exposures are substantial as well. Uh, the World Bank has estimated that air and water pollution contribute nearly 10% of the gross domestic product in Ghana and Pakistan, respectively. And this was a this is a somewhat low and dated estimate. Air and water pollution in China contributes costs on the order of 4% of China's GDP. These are the principles of sound chemicals management that really need to be implemented going forward if we're going to be serious about uh, protecting children and, and reaping those economic rewards that I described previously. Um, we need a perspective that informs the public, that gives the public the right to know about chemical hazards that are being used. It focuses, should focus on preventing pollution before it occurs. Making um, the polluter pays is not just a uh, noxious principle to industry. Uh, it's in fact not a noxious principle uh, to industry. It's actually what Adam Smith would have thought to be more appropriate. In fact, in the context of externalities of chemical manufacture and production, there is an overproduction of chemical exposures with an, a loss of economic productivity resulting and a price of, of, of chemical manufacture that's lower than the, soci the true societal price. And there's a substantial literature suggesting that either taxes or other incentives are actually needed to achieve an efficiently functioning market with respect to production of chemicals. Not to say that zero chemicals are the optimal um, economically produced amount of chemicals, there is some equilibrium. It's just that currently there is an overproduction with respect to what's societally appropriate. And we need substantial scientific data to inform the dialogue about chemical manufacture going forward. Um, just to provide a one quick takeaway, the chemical industry is a $3 trillion per year 
market. If we just spend 0.1% of the industry's annual revenues on protection and sound chemicals management, that would be a $3 billion co cost. It would simply be pennies on the, the proverbial dollar uh, that the chemical industry produces, but it would provide substantial resources on behalf of environmental prevention. So I'll stop there and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, Ellie Cohen wanted to ask, um, what is the safety of oleo resin as a replacement for BPA? Um, it's not been fully studied. Um, it's a plant and uh, otherwise naturally derived derivative. Uh, the few studies that have assessed it suggest potential safety, but um, I can't uh, speak in full to its safety, and that speaks to the, the serious flaws we have, not just in the Toxic Substances Control Act, but in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which doesn't require uh, testing of chemicals and documentation of safety before use of chemicals, even as inadvertent additives to foods. Okay, if anyone else has any questions, you can use the uh, hand raise icon, and uh, I'll call on you and unmute you so you can ask your question, or you can type it into the question box. Okay, another question. What would be the best suggestion for a BPA replacement at this time? Um, there are multiple options. There are, besides oleoresin, there also are tetra packs and alternative ways to store um, foods in antiseptic environments. Um, there are also polyester coatings that appear not to have the same uh, potential health effects. Uh, Lynn Katz-Sherry, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your presentation a lot. And I just wanted to comment um, that, you know, what's another aspect is that the all the costs are really obviously not captured by the traditional cost-benefit analysis. And so I wanted you to comment because you mentioned the differential between the cost and savings I think it was in regard to can linings. One was 1.7 billion versus 2.2 billion, and it, it seems to me that what's not included in those cost estimates are the um, the you know the time of that the parents spend in time work time lost and um, just the non quantifiable costs of the stress on families and the other you know, ripples that come out from that. So I thought maybe you could address that briefly. Thank you. It's uh, a great question. Thank you for the question. I think it's, uh, it, it, it's not even, I think it's well known that uh, indirect cost estimates are um, subject to the vagaries of potentially being underestimates and not incorporating lost work, lost, lost um, emotional value that are also attached to having healthy as opposed to unhealthy children. And um, one approach that economists use to avoid that difficulty is through um, um, using willingness to pay methods. Uh, that's not currently uh, widely used, but would get at some of the costs that you're talking about and the benefits of prevention. Can you ask your question? Yes. 
I was hoping he could compare the air quality uh, on the East Coast and compare it to the, the, the cities on the West Coast and um, in relation to the, the mercury and lead in, in the air, the volume. Well, um, this is rapidly evolving, especially as in the Far East, emissions of mercury appear to be making their way to the United States. Um, uh, but most of the mercury deposition is very local, such that um, in the Northeast, uh, where there's the greatest concentration of coal-fired power plants, the, the, the deposition is the greatest. Um, but beyond those generalizations, it's, it's, it is somewhat hard to um, get a firm read on what uh, fish levels are um, in various locations. Um, and that that speaks to uh, some of the flaws in the F in in the FDA uh, testing paradigm for mercury, where they really test a modest number of fish. The Environmental Protection Agency is substantially better. In general, air pollutants like particulate matter are extremely high in the far west. Um, cities like Los Angeles remain out of compliance. Um, and may well, even though there have been stringent um, national ambient air quality standards put into place in the recent years. Okay, uh, Sarah Howard had a question about uh, type 1 diabetes and the relationship with chemicals and how difficult it is to study that. Do you have any comments? It's difficult. It's not impossible. Um, there's substantial uh, evidence to suggest that uh, chemicals may be contributors to um, not just obesity but in insulin resistance and cardiovascular risk. Um, among the chemicals of concern uh, are phthalates, which have been associated with insulin resistance both in adult males and in children, and actually in adolescents, excuse me. Um, there also are concerns about uh, persistent organic pollutants and their associations with diabetes, mostly in adults. Okay, Kathleen Schuller, you can ask your question. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Chisande. I wanted to ask a question about your slide having to do with the um, astronomical increase in autism costs between 97 and 2008, and obviously having a lot to do with the, um, the rate of autism going up significantly. Have you done an analysis of the environmentally attributable, attributable contributors to um, those costs? Um, so, Kathy, great to hear from you, and thanks for your question. Um, there is a fundamental difference in data sources for economic costs between the two analyses. We used a much more recent and higher estimate. So that is also a contributor to the cost differential. Okay. We still have a lot of uncertainty around what specific causes are driving the contribution of environmental factors to autism. Um, air pollution seems to be uh, potentially a substantial contributor, um, though it's complicated in the fact that there's some genetic predispositions that also appear to increase or decrease that risk. Um, beyond that, um, it's still hard to say which are the environmental contributors that are driving that. Okay, and um, Frederick Miller wanted to know if you could give a brief overview of phthalates. Um, phthalates are uh, chemicals used to soften plastics, characteristically. There are uh, so-called low molecular weight and high molecular weight phthalates. The low molecular weight phthalates are used in lotions, shampoos, 
whereas the high molecular weight phthalates are used in flooring, among other industrial uses, but also used in food wrap. Um, and in particular, it's the, the DEHP, it's one particular high molecular weight phthalate that is thought to be uh, activating um, certain genes that are, are critical for insulin metabolism, glucose metabolism and insulin management. Um, so that's a rough sketch of the issues around phthalates. Okay, um, and what are some practical ways that people can limit the exposure to mercury in the air in their homes? The issue is chiefly fish consumption um, and eating healthy fish. Um, so king mackerel, tallfish, even some forms of tuna tend to be higher in mercury uh, in fish. And actually PSR is among the organizations that has, has, has the best guidance for families with respect to healthy fish consumption. It's still important to eat fish that are high in omega-3 fatty acids, which are so critical to brain development. Okay, and um, does plastic number one PETE have any health-related issues associated with it? At the present time, it's unlikely. However, uh, again, the lim there are limits to what one can say given the regulatory framework. Um, generally, one, two, four, and five are the safest plastics for use. Now, at the same time, one should microwave plastic um, one should try to wash plastic materials outside the dishwasher and with one's hands and soap and water. And when plastic is clearly etched, it's time to throw it away. Okay, and um, Jeffrey Saffer wanted to ask, if legislators and corporations are responding to your message and data? I, I would say there are some cases in which they are. Um, I think with res in the global environment, actually there's been more responsiveness than I would say in the U.S. environment. Um, I can't comment specifically about the recent responses to the BPA work. Um, eventually, the, there was response to the mercury work. And it was chiefly at the state level first and then at the federal level. Okay, and there's also a question about the safety of styrofoam. Um, Unknown compared with um, other uses, I, I, compared with um, the the with BPA with polycarbonate lined plastics and other um, plastics of concern, that it seems to be safer, but there are still controversies and still need a, f in f a further study. I don't provide specific guidance to families in this regard. 
Okay, and uh, Ali Cohn had another question about the uh, obesogenic activity of BPA. I'm not hearing the question yet. Um, sorry, I think she wanted to know um, how the um, PPAR gamma receptor works. Um, so the uh, PPAR gamma receptor um, specifically regulates insulin production in response to a glucose load. Um, the phthalates in particular dis, uh, disrupt PPR regulation in a very specific way that's in contrast to actually an anti-diabetic agent that uses PPAR called rosglitazone to have its potentially beneficial effects. So it's, it, there's something specific about PPR gamma regulation that is specifically dis, disrupted by phthalates. Okay, I think that was the last question. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and we're going to post the slides on the website if anyone wants to look at them afterwards. Uh, Julie, can you hear me? Uh-huh. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is Kathy Ather. I just wanted to, to um, thank Dr. Chisande for his very informative um, and interesting presentation. And I just wanted to, to wrap up with um, just giving folks um, a couple of advocacy opportunities that they can act on right now. Um, as Dr. Trasande mentioned in his uh, presentation, he talked about the need for reform of our uh, chemical ma management regulation system, and specifically the Toxic Substance Control Act. And there are currently two proposals at the federal level to overhaul uh, the Toxic Substance Control Act, but unfortunately both of these reform efforts are seriously lacking in public health protections. And so there's a bill currently before the Senate called the Chemical Safety Improve Improvement Act, and there's also a recently released House proposal called the Chemicals in Commerce Act. And um, like I said, unfortunately they both need vast improvements. Um, Specifically, um, some of the major flaws in the, in the two pieces of uh, legislation, they really fail to protect uh, vulnerable populations like pregnant women, the developing fetus, workers, and those communities disproportionately affected by pollution and or surrounded by chemical facilities. They're, the bills also have very weak safety standards for assessing chemicals. Um, they would also kind of continue these bills would really do nothing to get rid of chemicals that we know, like lead, asbestos, are hazardous to our health. They would really do little to kind of take these chemicals off the market. Um, and they would also roll back and impede a lot of the work that, the great work that's going on in the states related to um, reducing exposures to chemicals. And so, um, and finally, one of the other major flaws in both of these bills <clears throat> has to do with the idea of keeping information about chemicals, health, and safety from the public, and specifically health professionals. Um, the both bills, but, but particularly the recently released House bill, has um, provisions in it that would really prevent health professionals from, particularly doctors and nurses, from, from treating patients who have been exposed to toxic chemicals because it wouldn't allow them to know the identity of the of the chemical. And so in terms of, you know, health professionals, this would be that's one of the, you know, major ways that um, it kind of impacts what your your duties are as a health professional. And so um, right now, 
the House bill has just been released. It's a draft proposal, um, and PSR is going to be sending out an action alert on Monday to our members to tell them to talk to their representatives, to let them know that this is a bill that should not be supported, that we're opposing the bill, that their representatives should also oppose this bill. Um, and so if uh, PSR members, definitely we can ask you to respond to the action alert, um, make some calls to your representatives regarding the Chemicals and Commerce Act. That would be wonderful. Um, PSR is also putting together an organizational letter to send to the House committee um, in charge of the bill saying that we strongly oppose the, the, the current draft. Um, and as PSR is a member of the Safer Chemicals Healthy Families Coalition, this coalition has also put together an organizing kit. And so folks who are interested in getting more involved can contact me, um, and I can get you in touch with that information. Um, and so once again, I'm Kathy Attar from PSR. Um, I think you have my email, but I'll give it to you again. It's k-a-t-t-a-r at psr.org if you want to learn more about this current action in the House um, and also future efforts around toxics. And I just wanted to thank Dr. Trasande again for, uh, for joining us today and also all of the participants. I think it's a, this is a key issue and it's, um, it should be on the public's mind and I think having health professionals talk about this in a, um, and getting involved is, is key to kind of uh, moving these reform efforts both in the South Senate in the House in a manner that we would be interested in protecting the public health. So I just want to say thank you, and uh, everyone have a great weekend.